Live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America, bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and hope all of you are having a wonderful day. I know that here, um, you know, here where we are in North Carolina, we just got, you know, some unscheduled snow, but uh, it's not sticking. It's just looking gorgeous. So, hey, I'm uh, very happy to see that the holidays are finally upon us. Uh, everyone, welcome into the program. Today, both segments, we have the one, the only, the venerable Mr. Mike Sturmack, as we are going to be talking about a bunch of different topics. He comes on the show and we talk high tech, current events, and overall, just have a really fun time. I know that many of you enjoy our, enjoy our segments together, and we are happy that, uh, of course, that he can join us. So, uh, let's see, before we get started, a couple of things, including ComputerAmerica.com, that's where you'll find everything from the show notes, anything that we talk about, links, articles, uh, a link to our guest website, techguy.org, not hard to uh, not hard to remember, and of course, we just recommend that you check that out at ComputerAmerica.com. Uh, also, check out the live video feed, twitch.tv forward slash ComputerAmerica for all of your watching pleasure, and otherwise, hey, Sit back, relax as we start the show. So, uh, joining us today, as I said before, Mike Cermak, longtime correspondent, and uh, yeah, happy to have him back on. So, let's bring him on, and uh, yeah, let's actually hit the button. So, Mike, how you doing? Welcome back onto Computer America. Thank you very much, Benjamin. How are you doing today? I am doing just dandy. There is a. Uh, yeah. Like I said, it's snowing, so it's super cold out. But uh, of course, this time of year, it uh, looks gorgeous, and nothing, nothing to complain about. But I'm sure we'll find something. I just got a new snowblower uh, after the last snow. I'm in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. and we get snow here. And uh, I had an electric snowblower that um, that I've had for just about six or seven years, and it was at that time an electric snowblower was one you plugged in and had a giant extension cord for. Right, and it's really served me well. Uh, but this last time it snowed, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I suspect you got some as well. And I was out snow blowing, and this thing is just rusting apart and breaking down, and little pieces fall off of it, mm -hmm. and a big bolt fell off of it, and I very nearly snow blowed that bolt. Ooh. And uh, I decided, you know, it's time to break down and get an updated, newer snowblower. So I ordered this one. I'm very excited to try it. It hasn't snowed here yet. And I really want, if you could send a little bit of snow this way, <laughs> I really, really want to try my new snowblower. And this one is battery operated, just like my car. So I'm very excited about it. I can't wait to, to give it a go. You know, and, and I think that's that's the thing. I'm not an expert. Obviously, I grew up in Florida for 20 some odd years. Uh, I'm not an expert in snow by any means, but I would assume that because they salt the road so often, uh, there was this big conversation about, you know, cars in Florida versus cars from up north. And I would assume because they salt the roads and snowblowers, you know, get some of that salt as well. Uh, just like living next to the ocean, a lot of salt, a lot of corrosion, and uh, just kind of makes the whole thing worse. So I'm not sure if you can rinse one of these things, but I'm sure it would help metal last a little bit longer if it's not soaked in salt water. Yes, I think you're right. Just, I think you're yeah. right. I 
Yeah, and, and and again, just my two cents. It, uh, I, I for the, the, the difficulty is rinsing it down when it's below freezing yeah. outside. Yeah, absolutely. I, I completely uh, understand. Um, I think I, I need to move somewhere warmer with less snow. <laughs> but again, you have you a know, spare bedroom down there. Uh, you, uh, North Carolina, there's less snow, but you know it does get snow every so often. I got to say though, for the first time on the news the other day. Uh, you know, they were covering uh, you know, last week. Might have been the snow you're talking about. Uh, I saw a gentleman outside clearing his his sidewalk of snow, and for the first time, he had two uh, two leaf blowers going at the same time, one in each hand, and he was just <laughs> blowing snow off of his sidewalk. And I'm like, you know, if you get out there fast enough, um, it was working really, really well. It was different. That's funny. But but it would only work on that light stuff, right? Yeah. See, what we need, though, is I need an electric snowblower like the one I have now, battery-operated. But I want it to operate like one of those iRobot uh, uh, vacuum yeah. cleaners. I want to be able to just – I don't even want to have to hit a button. It can detect that there's snow out there and go out and do its thing. And I can just keep on sleeping in the warm, cozy bed. <laughs> there, there, there's a model. It's a, uh, it, it's a lawn trimmer slash um, gopher killer. And it does the exact same thing, but for your lawn – uh, I've seen those. I, I've seen them work pretty well. I think that they, you know, kind of have to work continuously because it, you know, it can't be too tall. But um, may, may, maybe they're working on it, or maybe uh, was it Boston Dynamic is going to make robots that can push it, you know, can push these things for us. Uh, either way, robotics save us. I hear you loud and clear. So everyone, as I said before, Mike Suramak, a longtime guest. If you are new, then I think this is a great time for Mike to explain what techguy.org is because you know, we talk current events. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun, but you also run, operate uh, techguy.org, which is our go-to site for troubleshooting community and just overall tech talk. Uh, what is the site? Yes, absolutely. Well, go to techguy.org, not tech guide, but tech guy. I'm a, I am a tech guy. And in there, you'll find the forums where people are trying to help one another with computer problems all day long, every day. Uh, the site has been around since 1996, one of the first tech support forums, communities out there, and still going strong. We have a lot of people in there, a lot of volunteers helping one another. And chances are when you go in there and post a question, you'll probably find another question that you know the answer to. Chances are there's always someone who knows a little bit less than what you do about a particular issue. Uh, so that's the way the site works. It's all free. Uh, it's paid for by the advertisements you see on the site. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. All kinds of – any kind of computer problem. You know, Windows 10, Windows 7, networking, you know, web development, removing viruses, you name it. There's probably someone there who can help you with it. So there's a new feature that uh, – you know, to kind of kick off our our conversation today, there's a new feature on Skype. I don't know if you heard about it, Mike. Uh, they just launched not. it about a day or two. And if you go to the plus button, you know, uh, kind of add-ons, normally it's like add a photo or share your screen or, you know, things like that. Uh, they added the ability to have real time uh, subtitles. And, so, and uh, you know, so that... I'm trying it on the show. I'm trying to figure out if there's some way that I can work it in so that uh, if I do real-time talking like you and I are doing, it actually puts it on the screen in text form. So, you know, maybe people who don't clearly understand us, they can see some text and it would be something that, uh, you know, that they could see. And we have it up right now. And it's funny because uh, you were talking and the real-time transcription uh, was going on and you said techguide.org and or techguide.org and not techguide. And it's funny because tech or Skype picked up your original uh, wording as techguide.org. <laughs> so you went back and clarified, and the text actually updated to tech guy. So no it's, kidding. Yeah, it, it was. So, uh, that's what I was speaking to. I wasn't speaking to our human audience. I was speaking to our <laughs> robot overlords. Right, and, and, but but you know, it's uh, sometimes it it gets too you know some, sometimes it gets too cluttered. It stops and then it'll start again. Overall, I'm actually very impressed with it. It's uh, it's kind of an extension of when um, they do real time transcription like this and then they also do real time translation. So it'll take the the speak the speech to text, translate that through some kind of, you know, Google Translate, but of course Skype, so Microsoft has their own. And then it will spit out a translated text version of what you're saying. Uh, it's an extension of that, but uh, yeah, it, I, I just think that Skype as a means of communicating I think, you know, now with people who maybe are hard of hearing or people of even different languages, it's becoming really impressive. I'm I'm really uh, liking this this feature. 
Well, and you could definitely see how that would be useful if you were speaking to someone who you know speaks a different language. Yeah, you know, if you could do instant translation, and why couldn't you? If you're tr- if you're putting you know, voice to text, it would, it's you know it's it's very simple to then convert that to uh, to another language these mm-hmm. days. Um, but I do that, you know, even in YouTube, they have their automatic closed caption system, which yeah. works relatively well most of the time, you know, as well as a computer can be expected to. And very often I'll turn it on when I'm, you know, laying in bed and don't want to make too much noise. I have the volume down on my, my, you know, iPad I'm watching and can go ahead and, and, you know, have the closed captions down there. And it works pretty well. You, you get the, sometimes you have to figure out what is actually meant, but you know, it's, <laughs> Uh, and and I would, considering it's all automated, yeah. our robot overlords are doing pretty well. I would say that the Skype version of it, just like you mentioned with YouTube and the uh, you know the automated uh, YouTube closed captioning, I would say that they are about on par with each other in terms of readability. But of course, uh, this being real time adds an extra you know kind of dimension to it. So I really like yes, it. Yes, absolutely, and, you're right. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's definitely super cool. So there's there's uh, and of course Skype. Microsoft owns that, which I think leads us nicely into our first topic. And this is one of the stories that you sent over, uh, something that they mentioned, I think, yesterday. But uh, unfortunately, we were, well, fortunately, because I like gaming, uh, we were doing our Gamer Tuesday. So it wasn't exactly within our purview, but completely within that today, Microsoft. And as much as I think a company needs to really look at a product that they're making and try to make it the best product that they possibly can. As much as I think that uh, improving is something that people should definitely do, when something isn't working, I hope that they do what Microsoft has done with the Edge browser. And this is just a rumor, I think. I, I don't know if they've officially announced it. You, uh, I you think know, you're right. You know, maybe this has been, you know, kind of, uh, and, and last I heard was from The Verge. They reached out to comment. Microsoft, I believe, said something along along the lines of, we don't comment on rumors. But this is an exciting <laughs> rumor because, let's face it, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pose the question and then leave this article up to you. But, Mike... How often do you do you use the Edge browser? Um, I think whenever I first install Windows on a computer, I use Edge so that I can go to google.com slash Chrome. I think that is absolutely <laughs> and, and, and really that was uh, that was Internet Explorer 10's I think claim to fame or eight or whatever was that the number one search term was install Chrome or uh, Chrome download like it's right. no it's not a hidden secret that people just kind of migrated away from the default. Yeah, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I mean, Microsoft gets a bad rap about their different browsers. There's various reasons not to like Edge, and we don't need to go into all of those. But, and of course, as a web developer, you know, some versions of Internet Explorer are just just terrible to deal with. I mean, you have to write special CSS code just to get around some of the stupid things that you know some versions of Internet Explorer do. Mm-hmm. So, anyhow, uh, there's a lot of good reasons to dislike it, but a lot of it is, I you know. People don't like the default. And, of course, viruses, if you're going to write a virus or some sort of malware for a website that's going to attack certain browsers, why wouldn't you hit the largest one out there and the one that your you know, users that don't know any better will be running? Uh, and really, uh, yes, there's security reasons. I think that people who are very tech savvy kind of know that as well. But even beyond that, I don't know what drives so many people to install Chrome, though, because... I'm sure that the amount of people who have, uh, you know, uh, let's say the Yahoo bar across the top of their browser, <laughs> is, it, it, <laughs> I'm sure that those. that number, yeah, and there were tons of them, or the Ask Me bar or whatever, but um, I'm sure that the number of people who have those bars is greater than the number of people who uh, download Chrome. Like, I'm, I'm just saying that. For the amount of people that probably don't know how to really use a computer, you know, efficiently or you know, with any kind of uh, with any kind of expertise, there's still a greater number than that that actually use Chrome and or you know, to a lesser extent Firefox. I'm just wondering why Edge hadn't kind of taken off because even its market share was well below what it probably should have been with the default. I, I it, do you think that this was and you know let's talk about you know kind of the downfall of edge or at least the not catching of edge and then what do you think about you know chromium because chrome and a version of chrome are what i think about 60 percent of people already use 
Yeah, uh, that that's right. I, I love Chrome uh, for, for a variety of reasons. It's not perfect, but I do love it. Um, I think with Edge, part of the problem is when it first launched, it didn't allow third-party add-ins, uh, which, you know, like those toolbars yeah. that everybody hates. So who cares about that? <laughs> but then, you know, I use a password manager, and everyone should, so that you don't use the same password or a variation thereof on every website. And so I need a an add-in for that. And there's various other, you know, there's some development tools. I have add-ins. Everyone has a, an excuse to have some sort of add-ins on their browser. That, that, that took a while for them to catch up on. There were a couple other little things with edge. I, and part of it is that it looked so different than previous versions and people don't like change. Yeah. I, and, and obviously I, E um, it had a huge dominance, but it was starting to look dated. And when they updated from internet Explorer to edge, that was their chance to say, okay, this is a modern browser. I think Chrome right. and Firefox were able to get away with it uh, with continuous small updates. Microsoft came in and tried to do a sweeping update, just wasn't there. And like you said, uh, personally, the ability to not have an ad blocker, and you know, trust me, I, I recommend everyone get an ad blocker. Uh, the ability not to have an ad blocker really just cemented the fact that I would never use this thing until I could. And I think even after, th uh, even after the point that I could, I just wasn't going to it's uh yeah it was too late yeah, yeah it, it was definitely it was too, too late. late at that point yeah I, I really think that's what it is and so the story is is that that we're discussing here is that the rumor is that microsoft is going to build a new browser uh or a new version of edge perhaps but it's going to be based instead of on their own software in the back end it's going to be based on chromium and chromium of course is is the is the base of google chrome and opera and the Amazon browser, if you have an Amazon device, and and a lot of other a lot of other browsers use Chromium as as the base for it, which is wonderful, especially for web developers, because then, you know, by and large, if your software or your website works well on one browser, it'll work well on others if they're they run the same base. If they're all based on Chromium, then you still need to check against Firefox and you know Internet Explorer for those who are still using that or Edge, and it, it just becomes a mess. So I I. It would be very interesting. Um, uh, so I always have mixed feelings about these things, Ben. Mm -hmm. I like the idea that it's going to be based on Chromium because I'm not a big fan of Edge and I do love Chrome. On the other hand, if every browser were based on the same code, that could be a bad thing. Yeah, There's I... pros and cons to everything, but I also don't like a monopoly. Uh, yeah, uh, and, and of course, monopoly in this sense, I... I I'm troubled with, with the word monopoly because there's a monopoly in terms of business where, you, you know, just not being able to compete with anyone else. It's it's Chrome or nothing or Chromium or nothing. Uh, that That's one thing. But maybe you're coming at this from a from a coding standpoint where there's no innovation because there's only one standard that anyone obeys. And if you deviate from the standard, then no one will uh, play nice. Uh, like are you talking about like uh, the ability to innovate? is kind of wiped out if everyone has to use the same browser? Yeah, I guess that's true. I'm trying to walk through this in my own brain. I, I think that's right. The, the ability ability to innovate is is reduced a little bit if, if everyone's using it. I mean, obviously, they're going to make changes to it. I mean, it, even between different browsers based on Chromium, there are, there are sometimes significant differences between them. Mm -hmm. But the actual rendering of them is more or less identical. Right. And and even beyond that, I mean, just having only Chrome or Firefox and even Firefox is having trouble, uh, you know, kind of keeping up, keeping up to speed. Uh, if Chrome says, you know, maybe that gives Google too much power to lay down, lay down the law and say, if we don't like, let's say, ad blockers one morning, then no one will have ability to have an ad blocker because Chrome says so. And that's also a problem. But I, I see where you're coming from. I, I, at the same time, though. Sticking with Edge and sticking with a Edge HTML, which was you know kind of the coding language behind the Edge browser, uh, sticking with Edge HTML, I can't help but feel that would have been just equally as stupid as um, you know trying to. Yeah, I think you're right. And and from their point of view, if you're Microsoft, why do you go to the trouble to and the expense to produce your own rendering engine and to then maintain it, which is a major task? Uh, you know. Basing it on an existing open source rendering engine makes all the sense in the world. I mean, from Microsoft's point of view, there's there's just I can't think of a good reason why they wouldn't do this. Right. So and and that's that's really my takeaway. And, and it will largely kill 
people the, the the reason that most people go out and switch browsers you yeah. know if by default windows has a chromium browser built in i'm far less likely to go to google.com slash chrome and install a different one i i completely agree with you and i think that google would still be happy because they still get to claim market share and microsoft would be happy because they get to claim that people are using their iteration of of the chrome browser i think that this is kind of a win-win because edge wasn't working but I, if, if I could pour all my, my add-ons and, you know, whatever features over to a default Windows one, and I could move from computer to computer, sign into my account, and have everything, all my bookmarks and everything, you know, kind of shift over, that would be a much more attractive than having to go out and get Chrome. Honestly, that, that's, that sounds like a great trade-off for me uh, to sure. finally go back. So yep, yeah. This might be the way that they actually bring some people back to Microsoft Internet browser whatever it's going to be called yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and i'm sure it might just be uh ed uh edgium or chrome edge or something like that but i think it's going to be a I good bet move. not i bet it's not going to have a name <laughs> like that i bet that's i think that would just cause even more confusion geeks will care what's under the hood but most people don't yeah <laughs> and of course um for in the chat room thank you for using microsoft's tarnish chrome web browser uh, I, I I I don't know. I, I honestly I will give them the benefit of the doubt. I will try it and uh, and see if it's something even worth using because it's much like you and I think much like a lot of people out there. Uh, I the reason that I switched from Firefox to Chrome way back when was that Firefox had a legitimate problem and it was a problem with security. Uh, I switched and ever since then I haven't switched. You know, like I I haven't even really explored anything else. Um, well, I, and until you have good reason to do so, you probably won't until there's a problem or you get a new computer and don't feel a need to get the different browser. Right. So I, I'll, I will try this. I will keep an open mind, but uh, I really think that this is the right move for Microsoft. Um, and, it definitely and, is for them. Hopefully it is for the consumer too, but yep. it definitely is for them. And of course, uh, as well, uh, it's still rumor. So hey, this may just be a whole bunch of, you know, kind of uh, weirdness that they're trying to do with something else. And, you know, we're just, I'm sorry, trying to read too much into patch notes that are open to change. But if this sure. does come to fruition, I'm okay with you it. Know, the other thing I think that gives me pause about everybody using the same rendering engine, and not everybody is, but if we were to go down that path, is if there was a security flaw in it, it would then affect all browsers potentially, rather than just yeah, you know, one rather than forty percent of the market, it could potentially be ninety percent of the market. That uh, and and hey, that does happen. Uh, there there have been like let's say uh, I remember the vulnerability for routers that were running WPA. Uh, encryption, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, and WPA was uh, there was a security flaw in it, and turns out that like ninety percent of routers were running WPA, and they and they immediately said everyone switch over to WPA two, uh, all the other routers, eh, you're kind of SOL, and, and especially for uh, products that only had WPA uh, capability. Like sometimes it does happen, you know. You think that just because something is used everywhere, it's bulletproof, it's been tested, but right, no. But that may just be a huge risk. Yeah, I, I, absolutely possible. But uh, but hey, let's see if the rumor's true, and then we can all uh, you know act like our hair's on fire. So there's that one. Microsoft uh, again, kind of. I personally think kudos to them. Let's discuss, um, oh, you know what? Actually, since we're going from browser to browser, and I think DuckDuckGo has their own browser uh, centered around their own search engine. But, uh, but yeah, so DuckDuckGo, uh, for anyone out there who's not familiar, it's kind of like Google, but uh, instead of Google tracking every keystroke that you put into it and applying it to you as a person and knowing more about you than even your, you know, even your most close loved ones. Um, DuckDuckGo promises to be completely, uh, completely private. You know, they don't collect anything about you. They promise to be open, free, whatever. And yeah, that's the point. So here we go. This article, I'm going to send it over to you, Mike. And of course, we'll uh, copy it in the show notes for anyone out there who wants to check it later. Let's go ahead and do that. And uh, yeah, so... DuckDuckGo, privacy focus DuckDuckGo finds Google personalizes search results even for logged out and incognito users. This is not the first time that we've seen this. Uh, just to tie it into another company real quick, Facebook, uh, who we might just talk about next. But 
these companies that their job is to vacuum up personalized data, apply it to a person and create a profile that they can then sell to advertisers saying that, hey, here's the information about Ben. Here's what Ben likes. Here's what Ben searches about. It's an enor- it's it's a crazy amount of duck facts. I don't know. Whatever Ben does, um, these these companies are able to sell it to advertisers. And just like Facebook, just like Google, they are learning to attribute the information to people who are not specifically using their services. I know that let's say you delete your Facebook account, Facebook will create, you know, let's say there's a Ben Facebook account, Ben deletes that. Facebook will then create a blank name template A. And blank name template A is then attributed with all of Ben's data. And while it doesn't say Ben strictly on the account, they still have these shadow accounts that they can say that this person, whoever template A is, this person goes to these websites, does these things, and we can sell this no-name person to advertisers just like we would if we were given an actual name or, i.e., someone were to sign a, uh, you know, kind of a binding contract with us. This has been happening. Turns out DuckDuckGo coming out with a study that says that Google does the exact same thing. Mike, you've been on the show before and you've mentioned... You know, privacy, it's uh, it, it's it's kind of a nice idea, but it's not needed in today's day and age. It's, we, we, we've all succumbed to the beast. I'm not sure if beast. those were my exact words. Well, then explain your exact <laughs> words and explain how or what you kind of think about the idea that regardless of whether or not that you create an account, if you hit I accept your terms and conditions, these companies have the ability and nay, actually and actively do uh, track you and attribute data like this to you. Yeah, well, for one thing, some of the information that they're using is for features that you want. I remember when cookies first started back in my day, Ben. Let me tell you, we walked uphill both ways. And when cookies first came out, people didn't like them. And there were, you know, people would just block all cookies. But then, you know, whenever you went to check your email and you weren't automatically logged in or you went to check the weather and it didn't already know where you were located, Mm -hmm. people got annoyed and started accepting cookies. And I remember when Gmail first came out and people were all upset because they were going to have ads inside their email. But in exchange for that, you get a free giant inbox that works really well. And now everybody has a Gmail account. And it's it's a trade is my point is that you know you're trading some privacy you're trading some advertising you're trading something for these free services these companies aren't out there doing it out of the goodness of their hearts and you shouldn't be thinking that they are i don't think that <laughs> i don't think they're trying to fool anybody this is you know if you're not sure, if you're not paying for something then you are the product so i think the the, the big concern here and this is uh, again everything done through duckduckgo duckduckgo has of course their own uh, you know, just to be completely blunt about it, they have their own agenda to push where anyone who is concerned about privacy knows the name DuckDuckGo. That is their thing, and that's why they rail against this so hard. But here's the part that, uh, you know, to your point, you mentioned that, you know, people are willing to tr- to accept these trade-offs for the benefits. But what happens when most, per- and the, this is directly from the article, let's say just point one, most participants saw results unique to them. These discrepancies could not be explained by changes in location, time, being logged into Google, or by Google testing algorithm changes to a small subset of users. Essentially, they had no relationship. They were getting nothing from Google, but Google was still personalizing and uh, delivering different results to individuals who didn't have anything to do with Google. I think that's the big part here. It's not about people who have accepted the terms and conditions, but it's just about anyone who's done this. Um, there's a little bit of, of of a gray area in there, I think. Yes, I'm I'm skeptical of this. I, I to be perfectly honest, I guess I need to go to their website to read the full story. So, how would Google? create this bubble if you're doing for example if you're in a a private browser mode like uh you know what's it called in google uh, incognito, incognito or right? one of those how would they still be tracking you so uh, i guess by IP incog- address but well, well yeah and, and there are a couple of ways that they can do this we've talked to other companies who do this for security reasons although i'm sure google uses their technology for obviously ad reasons uh, little things like, you know, if you, uh, let's say you move your cursor off to the right of your screen and click just to, you know, kind of get it out of the way, they can attribute that, uh, any, any kind of way that you behave, anything that you read, any way that you act, 
And also, they can track you based on... I know incognito makes you think that you have just turned on the most James Bondiest version of your computer. But all incognito does, and I'm not you know lecturing you, Mike, because I'm sure that you know this, but to everyone oh, out sure. there, it simply makes it so that... Uh, for and it, I'm, I'm sorry. Just a quick, I just, there we go. So all Incognito really does is that your browsing session, nothing is stored on your computer. Uh, you still get cookies. You still get them from website to website. It's just at the end of it, it deletes all the cookies off of your side, of, you know, off of your computer, and it deletes your browsing history. It deletes uh, just everything that you've done. It's good for certain purposes, but it doesn't exactly um, it doesn't exactly prevent people from tracking you. That it, it does the exact opposite. It lets them track you all they want. It's just there's no record of it on your computer after you've done it. So they can still track you uh, even in incognito mode. It's just you know there's going to be no record record of it on your browser. Right. And I, I, are we close to break? Oh, oh, I, I, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, that's actually what I did. I just paused it. So let's go ahead and uh, let's see. So let's go ahead and play. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. So I have this here. Wow. I just closed out that thing. So here we go. Okay. It's playing in the background. So, yeah, Mike's right. It's time for our mid-break. <laughs> Everyone, we'll be right back. More Computer America. More Mike Cermak. We'll wrap up with this article about Google and that kind of thing. We'll leapfrog into Facebook. And uh, and trust me, there is some uh, interplay there. And then we'll move on to some more lighthearted stuff. But in the meantime, everyone, stay tuned. More Computer America right after this. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer. And again, airfare... What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low-cost airlines. With one call to low-cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. And welcome back to the Computer America Show. It is 32, 33 minutes past the hour, whatever it is, as we continue on here with Mike Cermak, TechGuy.org, and of course, uh, more here from uh, from Computer America. And yes, I just got a link, so we'll check that out as well. I like clicking on random links from Mike Cermak. If you ever wanted to hack me, it'd be super easy, because I trust the guy. And we feel you should too. So everyone, welcome back into the program. If you miss any part of today's show, check out wherever podcasts are heard, Computer America, search it, you'll find it. And of course, social media, you can reach out and tell us there. Now, uh, sure people hmm? just click random links that I send them and then fill in their password. You know, it's just <laughs> makes, yeah. it makes life so much easier. And and of course, it's fun to uh, act like you're other people. But tell me about this link you just sent, uh, Google Search Liaison. So this is yeah. 
Yeah, so this is um, Google's uh, Danny, uh, what is his name? Danny, I don't remember now, but he's he's responding to this particular article from DuckDuckGo about what they actually do and do not use for personalization. And of course, as you would expect, they say that they do use location, So, yeah, which is useful. We all expect that. If I'm sitting here in Pennsylvania and search for McDonald's, it might show a map with some of the nearby McDonald's, right. whereas if I'm sitting next to Ben very creepily, I would see a different <laughs> result. Um, and, and so location obviously is something that goes into account. Uh, they talk about some of the other things that they use, but it's, it's nothing, you know, they, they don't use search history between logged in users is what they're saying, uh, which goes against what DuckDuckGo is sort of implying. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm skeptical of this because I don't know technically how they would do it reliably. Google's pretty amazing. But, for example, if you switch between two different browsers or go into incognito mode, uh, as you were starting to say before the break, your computer doesn't keep the cookies connected between those two sessions. Right. Uh, and so th there's no connection as far as the website you're visiting goes. If, if, you know, if I go to google.com and log in under my Gmail account on one browser and then switch to another browser or go into an incognito uh, window and go to google.com, I'm not logged into that account anymore. And Google doesn't know that that particular session is the same from even from the same computer. Now they can see that it's from the same IP address mm -hmm. and could make some assumptions based on that. But that's kind of a risky assumption because but, but in even, most... Yeah. Oh, I'm, say again? I'm, uh, no, and, and you're right. I was just about to jump in and say I think your point, which is, you know, hey, there could be two people at the same house. Yeah. Sure. Or if it's a university, there could be a thousand people behind that same IP address or, you know, a large business. There could be thousands of people under the same IP address. Uh, so that's, you know, you can make some assumptions based on that, but, but I don't know if you could go so far as to assume that it's the same user. And suppose that it's, you know, uh, the IP address is actually that of a cafe or something. You know, that user could be someone who's never even been connected through that IP address before. And so I, or it could be a mobile phone, right? You know, if you're connecting through your mobile phone, that IP address changes pretty frequently. That's, you know, you're not going to be able so, to learn much that way. Yeah. I'm, and, I'm, uh, anyhow. Yeah, it, no, it, it's um, it completely makes sense. You could see where DuckDuckGo would try to paint, um, I think Google as this omnipresent, completely, uh, you know, going to uh, connect connect the dots where there are no dots that Google is connecting. You can see where DuckDuckGo, in favor of privacy, would want you to believe that. But uh, you know, kind of reading some of the replies here to this chain of tweets that uh, that Google sent out, uh, you know, some people are of course pointing out the very obvious fact that. Uh, to say that they don't personalize searches, uh, you know, uh, between these computers, especially incognito, what have you, that's assuming you don't consider, like you were saying, uh, location a part of personalization. Uh, right, yeah. And, and, and you know, one, one of the biggest things there is that DuckDuckGo, they were testing on very, I think, hot button issues, and especially around the term, you know, uh, around the midterms where they were talking things like gun control, immigration, they were talking, you know, obviously topics that are going to have a very loud and wide range of opinions they were using location to serve up different different articles and different things like that um i think that that you know that kind of personalization like you said it's not very personal you know knowing that i'm from north carolina doesn't really give you that much information but it is personalization now one thing that I will give you, though, one thing they could do, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking about this more and more as we talk, is that, you know, Google has, tr you know, a lot of websites have some sort of Google code on them that will allow them to track you for various reasons. You know, a lot of websites use Google Analytics, for example, which allows that website owner to be able to see how many people are visiting their, their website and, and some basic information about them, not personalized information, but some, you know, general so reports about it. But that, that could be used by Google to personalize things. I could potentially see technically how they could do that. Even if you were to open a new incognito window and be anonymous as far as Google is concerned, if you then go to a couple of websites that Google has tracking code on and then do a search, they could they could customize their search based on that. I, I don't have any reason to believe they are, but they technically well, could. <laughs> Mike, congratulations. You have just uh, analyzed out a strategy that has been used by a number of companies, and I'm going to say primarily Facebook because uh, this is going to be our next topic, which is Facebook. Uh, and, and, you know, actually, before we get, get into the article, what you just said is exactly what Facebook does. Facebook ha has such a premium on data 
And that's why, you know, let's say, let's say uh, my mom, she deleted her Facebook account. She, you know, she didn't like the fact that people were tracking her. And I was like, that's very sweet of you. But at the same time, not going to work because, <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes at the top of pages, you say, you know, you see these little buttons, you know, like us on Facebook or maybe Mike, you know, you've signed up for services and they're like, log in with Facebook and we'll right. fill out the we information offer that for you. on our website. We're yeah. happy to to be a conduit for tracking. A absolutely. And it's those kinds of sites where even if you don't sign in with Facebook and you make a new account, blah, 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 Facebook has been found to actually go out to these sites and buy their data. You know, I, you only think about Facebook selling data to, to advertisers and places like that. But it's true. Facebook is actually one, one of the biggest buyers of data from other sites. So let's say that I don't trust Facebook. I don't have an account, but I do trust uh, TechGuy.org. And I make an account with TechGuy.org and things like that. Uh, I'm not saying that you have ever been approached by Facebook, but uh, your... <laughs> well, but here's the thing. They wouldn't even have to buy it. If, you're, if their codes are running on the website, they could make that connection for themselves. They they definitely could, and then other analytical companies that uh, you know work, let's say, serve up ads that aren't Facebook, that aren't Google, whatever it may be. Facebook will actually buy the data and then uh, combine it with what they already have. This is something that that they have admitted that they do. I mean, it's uh, it's not really a secret, which is why. Uh, you should take articles like these. This one from Business Insider. I don't think I sent this to you. I should probably do that. But uh, this one from Business Insider. And they say that Facebook employees, uh, I'm glad that they censored the word. I'm not going to say it's uh, verbatim. But Facebook employees <laughs> are reportedly so paranoid that they're buying burner phones to talk uh, stuff about the company with each other. And the company being Facebook. Uh, mm -hmm. obviously you can tie your mobile number with Facebook, Facebook, if you use things like uh, Facebook messenger, they track and listen to phone or listen to conversations, uh, being had on there. It's no secret. A lot of data is sucked up by Facebook. So the employees themselves to talk with reporters, to talk with each other about Facebook, because people are prone to gossip and they want to, you know, vent their opinions without any kind of backlash. They're buying burner phones, i.e. these cheap little $10, $20, $30 phones that you buy SIM cards for that cannot be attributed to this person. And then they, you know, say, say their piece there so that they aren't overheard or, uh, you know, kind of fingerprinted by Facebook as saying these things. There's really no, no place to be anonymous on any device that you have connected at any point with you and your person in Facebook. I think is the point of this. Yeah, I, I would argue probably even more so with Google. I, I bet, and I don't have any numbers to, to back this up with, so I'll just make an outright claim with no data. <laughs> but I would bet that there are more websites with Google's tracking code on it than there are Facebook's. Google is, I think, kind of the go-to if you want ads on your site. Many people use Google Ads or Google, Google Analytics. Absolutely. And uh, but at the same time, if you provide a service, you know, such as let's say log into an account, uh, I think a lot of people also use Facebook because Facebook is also that giant entity that everyone has a Facebook account. So make it easy for people sign in with Facebook. Sure. It, it, it's, well, and it's I'm, really the two. I'm looking at Computer America's website, and I see Google Analytics, I see Google Fonts, I see, mm -hmm. you know, so Google is, I mean, as you would any website, don't of get course. me wrong, it would be, today, it would be a rare website, and, or an ancient website that wouldn't have some kind of code running from Google. And uh, and so it's yeah. it's simple for them then to see that request coming from you, have a, a cookie for this particular session and be able to to realize, even if they can't say, okay, this is Mike or this is Ben, they can say this is a user who has been to this site and this site and this site, and we can then make assumptions about them based on that. I and 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 yes, we put Google ads on our sites and I am given so, so many as as to probably ninety percent of uh, websites out there, and but like you know that the back end when you're talking about you know how, how to get more traffic, like they are able to pull so much data from you know, uh, and of course the site can personalize and tailor what ads are shown to people and if you want them personalized to people, uh, things like that. I mean. 
there's a lot of data and you start to see the value of this data. So when we talk about these stories, which we're going to switch off because I don't want this whole uh, show to be, you know, sure. how evil tracking is. No, uh, you know, way at the beginning, you mentioned that people enjoy the benefits of, you know, this kind of thing. People enjoy that when they search for maybe a relevant television, hey, they're shown a television that's relevant to them and not just the population of India. Uh, people enjoy, I think, uh, the benefits of this, but it needs to be kept in check, or at least at the very least, people need to be aware of what's happening. Even if they aren't going to fight it, they should at least know that's, uh, that's an important part to me. So, okay. There's that, uh, again, Facebook, that's a whole nother can of worms. Let's see, let's see, let's see. So how about... This one was interesting. We need a happy story. Uh, yeah, I, and this, this one like is it's happy. It's been a very depressing, you know. <laughs> yes, yeah, Big Brother's coming after you, that kind of thing. But I and will there's say, no hope. And there's no hope. But maybe there is, <laughs> and maybe. Oh, actually, I have a joke, and then we'll get into the story. Uh, right. What's the difference between a Zippo and a Hippopotamus? What? No, wait, 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 wait. I think I messed up. The, I think I messed up. The joke oh. Anyway. Uh, what, let's see. Let's see. Uh, what's uh, all, right, all right. I'm going to Google the joke. Make sure I get it. Tell us about Zippo trademarks, the lighter click noise, because I think everyone, if you think about uh, a Zippo lighter lighting, it's that little scratchy uh, flint striking and that kind of thing. Talk about Zippo and why they decided to trademark their click noise. And also, if you feel up to it, what the heck is ASMR? <laughs> yes, well, that's a whole different topic now, isn't it? So the, the Zippo lighter, I didn't realize this, but apparently the noise of a Zippo lighter is unique enough that they could get a trademark for it. And I don't use a lighter on a regular basis, so I never would have guessed that to be the case. Also, but as it turns real out, quick, real quick, before you get in, I found the joke. What's the difference between a Zippo and a Hippo? What? One's really heavy and the other one's a little lighter. I don't. I. I, I don't. Do, do I have a rim shot here? I think I do. But uh, uh, oh, oh no, it's broken. Oh, that's oh, do you, but do it, you have a boo sound because that uh, would be really helpful right now. No, I don't. I. That's, I think I can hear the chat room booing, so that's all right. Yeah, my sound effects are all so in, in inferior to Craig's. But I will say there you go. Uh, but yeah, so Zippo trademark. Who knew? That's pretty interesting. Yes. The sound of the the lighter and and the article here, you know, uh, mentions about MGM's Lion Roar and some theme songs and Intel's chimes and now the lip the Zippo lighter clicking. It's uh, it's I don't know. I'm kind of surprised by that. But nah, in yeah. any event, so Go they ahead. they have done that and and they released a video uh, about it with ASMR uh, and so ASMR. Boy, I don't remember what it stands for. Do you remember a Ben? Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. Yeah, I don't know why I didn't remember that. <laughs> so what ASMR is basically is is some people, most people have some response to noises. Boy, how do you explain it? It's, uh, it's the, the low, way that I yeah the the way that I've heard it explained is that uh, you get head tingles, you get like a, a little tingle that runs over your scalp, and uh, it's just like there it's. You can Static trigger it through different. Is what I've heard. Yeah, kind of like that, and you can trigger it through different sounds and noises. Trust me, I've had it explained to me. Um, I think it's honestly, I think it's a little sexual. I, I, I don't really understand uh -huh. a lot of what's out there, but uh, and it does not affect me in any way whatsoever. I've heard weird things like fingernails on like honeycombs and, and weird stuff like that. I just don't get it, but it's hugely yeah. popular. No, you're you're right, and and there's a lot of them with you know lip smacking or or oh, you know, a lot of it oh, is, is torture. It, it's torture. Quiet sounds being made louder, and and people are just sensitive to hearing them. And and in any event, so they they made a video with ASMR that basically it's someone just fondling a Zippo lighter in various ways and making strange sounds and having those amplified so that you can actually hear them. You know, like you said, scratching on a lighter or or flipping it open or lighting it and and these sort of things. And, and, and again, you know, it, it's never like, like the nails on the lighter. It's never like, uh, you know, some, some long distance truckers fingers scratching against a lighter. Like it's always, uh, you know, very well manicured, cute hands. And it's like, I, I swear to God, I 
think it, it goes down that road more often than people will admit, but Zippo making an ASMR video, unfortunately, I think it's going to do really well. I think it's going to do <laughs> really well. It, it, it seems jokey. And of course, AS, and, and of course, uh, Zippo doing it, who sells lighters, they don't sell their YouTube channel. Uh, it's different, but unfortunately, I think it's going to do really well. It's pretty, it's, it's clever. I mean, it's playing into the current modern memes that are going around. So uh, good on yes, them. Yes, absolutely. There you go. And we have a link to this, uh, in the show notes. If you want to check out the videos, video yourself and, and let us know how the ASMR works for you. Let us know if you ben get the head to hear in detail. I, you mentioned like the lip smacking and stuff like I, Oh, if, if you ever want to get any information out of me, tie me down in a chair and make me listen to people eating ASMR, and I will give up anything for, to, to make it stop. It is so gross. But I digress. You're right. That was a little bit happier, much better, but uh, still kind of weird. <laughs> Speaking of kind of weird, so we mentioned this on the show. We're not going to get too far into it. Just wanted your opinion as, uh, let's see, you know, as a parent, uh, Tumblr. They are banning all adult content starting December 17th. Um, Tumblr itself, if you don't know it, it's a place to put a your personal blog. And your personal blog, let's say you are an art connoisseur, uh, you can reblog other people's artwork or you can put up your own artwork where people can then you know kind of reblog it or you have motivational quotes. There's a lot of different uses for it, but no hidden secret. Uh, Tumblr has been a great place for people to self-publish or even just publish very gross and offensive forms of pornography. And I guess uh, after a certain incident that got Tumblr taken off of the Apple Mm. uh, iTunes store, they have decided a strict no pornography or no adult content on their service whatsoever. And of course, this you know they have a full list of exactly what's not ban- what's not allowed. But uh, long story short, Tumblr is banning porn. Uh, this article caught your eye. Again, we've kind of been over the basics. What do you think about this? Why? What? What about this? Well, finally, someone's getting rid of all of the porn on the internet. It's <laughs> yeah. just you know. No. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> now, well, you're quite right. So that's the one thing that that kind of I think helped Tumblr. Yeah, it differentiates it is that it really has been known for being so open as far as their community standards go. They accept anything, you know, whatever you want to post about, they largely don't care. As long as you're doing it on their service, they're happy about it. Mm-hmm. And and this is a big change from from that and and pretty shocking. A lot of people are are upset about this. This is this is controversial. People expect it to be this open platform well, where people don't if forget. You want to, yeah, and and, and yeah. don't forget that uh, Yahoo w- uh, purchased Tumblr. I think yes. uh, four or five years ago. Yeah, that's right. And and I think part of it is, um, I, I don't know. I suspect there's a lot of things going on here. One theory that I heard that I think has some some legs to it is it's about advertising. Uh, there's advertising platforms that won't work on you know don't, don't want to deal with Tumblr just because there is so much inappropriate. Yeah, you know, content it, on it, there. It's kind of like YouTube and kind of like Reddit to a certain extent, where Reddit had to delete or you know ban a couple communities on their service, and just like YouTube, it's like uh, people. But neither were, one went to this extent. I mean, no, 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 not at all. This and is this is all the way. This is definitely all the way, and and you know certain forms of you know adult content are still allowed. Uh, not gonna get into those, but I will say that I. I Brands are so protective of their brand that for people to ever be able to screenshot their phone, their computer, and have, let's say, let's take YouTube, for instance, um, you know, some weird conspiracy nut job uh, going off about white supremacy, and then at the same time have a Ford truck uh, banner posted across the video. And sure. that image being then going viral saying that, you know, look at Ford advertising on this white supremacist video, which, you know, you know, I know, and a lot of people listening to the show should know, it's all automated. You know, that's just, right. that's just kind of how, you know, if you, if you refresh the page, maybe uh, Sephora makeup products would have came up. Um, 
but advertisers are afraid of that. Advertisers are afraid of that picture that could well, happen. And more than that, I think they're just a brand association. They don't want their brand associated with that sort of content. Of they, you know, that it's, it, yeah, people understand that the two aren't related, but they want to make that impression. They want to make that, that even if it's, even if it's not something you're even realizing, even if it's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, but you want to, to have, yeah. you want to have that correlation with with good happy things yeah as and, an advertiser as yeah, a brand absolutely so i think that this uh obviously this will make it easier for tumblr to sell itself to advertisers but uh as many people have pointed out uh you know porn kind of made tumblr it's it's uh, a lot of a lot of the content that was shared there uh, and I've seen stories about uh, you know individuals who ran two different you know Tumblr accounts. One was a personal, let's say, art and video game account, and the other one was a you know an adult content account. The adult content just gets shared a lot more, followed a lot more. It's uh, you know like, like like you said, if you want to share pictures of your cat, Tumblr probably wasn't the best place. You had Facebook for that. You have Twitter for that. Uh, cat videos are on YouTube all day long. Uh, where Tumblr stood out and was different was in this exact area. So, so they're removing yeah. the thing that was the differentiation for them. I, yes. And I think that could be dangerous. It, it could be dangerous for them as a service, but if, uh, because it, it, hmm? a lot of people may move on to another platform. I mean, this is how social media platforms change. Yeah, uh, that's uh, you know that's exactly what happened to MySpace. You know, MySpace. Um, you know, Facebook did what MySpace promised to do better, and yeah, MySpace just couldn't adapt. So maybe this is Tumblr trying to adapt, but adapt in the wrong way. Uh, business policies aside, I get where they're going with this. I think even their own CEO was like, uh, "We don't think that we are going to end pornography on the internet as we know it." <laughs> he, he said that uh, there are other places to go. We encourage you to go to those. Just don't come here with that. That's what their CEO said, and. Uh, I think I get his attitude. I just don't know how well from a business point of view it's going to work out. But that one was interesting. Again, uh, we talked about that, I think, on Monday. So if anyone wants more conversation on that, there you go. We have time for like one more quick, brief, brief, brief thing. Uh, what's this whole, what's, what's Tom Cruise up to? Uh, he's, <laughs> he's fun. Talk about Tom I'm Cruise. rarely someone who cares about Tom Cruise, but in this particular case, they issued a PSA. I think it just came out today uh, with him and the director of uh, the new Mission Impossible movie telling everybody some very important information that if you have a newer HDTV, you need to go in and turn off motion smoothing, which is really a PSA everybody needs to know. Why is that? Oh, <laughs> well, what's wrong with motion smoothing? Yeah, motion smoothing is is a feature, I use that in quotes, of a lot of HGTVs that have to do with the cycles, the hertz that the screens run at. And in order to make the image look a little bit better under some circumstances, especially if you're watching sports games, go sports, uh, <laughs> it then has a negative effect on movies and the way they were designed to be shot and, and, and displayed. Mm -hmm. And so they're encouraging people, at least while you're watching movies, to turn it off. And if you're watching sports, you can turn it back on if you really need to. But it's it just it it kind of just I don't know it it, it creates smoother video. We um, have talked about this, and uh, we've talked about this with our we, we we have a correspondent that uh, that works in Hollywood with this kind of thing. And you, you're right. It, it uh, let's say you have a point A and a point B, two separate frames, and the computer can then generate images between point A and point B, saying here's where we start, here's where we need to end. Let's uh, let's combine the two a little bit and make one in the middle. Uh, it turns it a looks, it, yeah. it, it it be, because a traditional uh, traditional cinema is shot at twenty four frames per per second. That's kind of what gives movies their movie look and not live television. When you add frames, you take people out of that movie kind of feeling, and that's what this can do. Um, I will say that I've seen it work very well. There's a there's a World War One documentary. I think it's like uh, they will not grow old or something like that. They use that kind of technology to bump up really old, really jittery uh, footage from World War One to make it look mm -hmm. almost uh, almost modern. It's it's very very cool technology when used in the right way. But I guess Tom right. Cruise and others are saying there's a wrong way to use it. 
Yeah, and the problem is that most TVs come with this turned on by default, and people don't even know that it's a thing. They don't realize that. And some people look at TVs and realize there's something wrong, but they don't know what it is. Right, right, right. So, uh, everyone, the music in the background, which should be starting right about now. All right, so music in the background means that we are about done. Everyone, thank you for joining us here on Computer America. Mike Suramak, TechOut.org. Mike, uh, last word. Uh, and by the way, this will be the last time that you join us till the end of the year you should be back uh beginning of january everything goes well but uh yep. yeah last words please so thank you very much everyone have a great new year uh check out techguy.org if you need any computer support with your new gadgets that hopefully santa will be bringing you perfect 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 and uh and hey everyone we have a link to that in in the show notes computer america at computer america and mike i want to thank you for joining us it was as always a lot of fun my pleasure have a great day have a great one you too everyone else thank you for joining us here on the show if uh again if you miss any part of today's show check out the podcast wherever podcasts are heard you can find it right there in the meantime uh join us in tomorrow we actually have a company uh, i'm sorry we have a spokesperson for ending hunger in america it's possible and this next guest is going to help us do exactly that so everyone catch you here tomorrow bye-bye thank you so much <laughs>